Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to this TechStrong Learning Experience brought to you by Fairwinds. My name is Cody, the host of TechStrong Learning, and we have an exciting panel ahead. Before we kick things off, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. Today's session is being recorded. If you miss any of our discussion, perhaps you'd like to rewatch or maybe share with a friend. The on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. Now, if you'd like to engage with us today, you've got a couple of options to do so. The first of which is the general chat, which can be found on the right side of your screen. I'd like you to start warming that up for us. Let us know that it works by letting us know where you're tuning in. Directly to the right of that chat tab, you'll notice it says Q&A. For any questions that you might have, we want you to send those in there. It just helps us keep better track of them. Uh, we do have two polls that we will be launching throughout this program, so please keep an eye out for those as we really want your feedback. And of course, before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around for the duration of our program today. So our topic today is a platform team's guide to Kubernetes. And I'm joined by Andy Suderman, CTO at Fairwinds, Kendall Miller, technology evangelist at Fairwinds, and Alex Crane, Enterprise Architect at Chick-fil-A. So Kendall and Andy, Alex, thank you all so much for joining me. Kendall, do you want to get this thing going? Uh, we'll go ahead and take over. Thanks, Cody. So hey, folks, and welcome. Um, I am in a remote part of Switzerland right now, and so my internet may be a tiny bit flaky, but I seem to have a pretty good connection. But uh, bear with me if my camera gets jittery. I'll try to pose in cool positions before the camera stops. Um, we are going to be talking all the things Kubernetes today and platform teams and how we think about building uh, the foundation on which people deploy software at, at companies. So uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. And um, let's go ahead and start with introductions. Andy, you want to start? Sure. I'm Andy. I'm the CTO here at Fairwinds, a uh, contributor and author of a good number of our open source projects. I've been working in Kubernetes for about seven years at this point now. I've been with Fairwinds for five. And uh, I just, I love doing Kubernetes. That's all I do. Okay, well, thanks. And uh, Alex, I'm noticing that in this picture, you are decidedly beardless, but bearded in real life. And I'm very bearded in the picture and beardless in real life. So we've we've done a little uh, swippy swap here. I don't know what the correct English word is there, but I'm pretty sure I nailed it. Um, anyways, uh, I'll go next, uh, folks. I'm Kendall. Um, I'm a technology evangelist at Fairwinds. I've been involved in the company from the beginning and kind of done everything uh, throughout the years here. And I'm um, excited to be here, dialed in. We were going to be joined by another person, Dean Haystad, who uh, is also a... Um, a customer of Fairwinds and and friend of us. That's what he was going to dial in. But unfortunately, he's in a part of the world where the internet is not cooperating today. So we had him dial in and test it out. But uh, it was very long delays and very interesting talking over things. So we asked Dean to just not join, not worry about it. He'll be with us in a future webinar. Um, but uh, Alex is still here. And Alex, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself? Absolutely. Uh, I'm Alex Crane. Uh, I'm the enterprise architecture team at Chick-fil-A. Um, Worked with Kubernetes since uh, kind of the the big year in Austin. Uh, man, was it six years ago now when kind of Kubernetes really kind of slingshotted up that year into a lot of people's view? Um, so uh, the, the big year of KubeCon in Austin is what you're, the year that it snowed in Austin when it yes. should not be snowing in Austin. Yes, yes. Yeah, hell froze over, and it was uh, time for Kubernetes to take over. Apparently. Sometimes, sometimes that happens. Although sometimes I just inferred Austin was hell, which really wasn't the intention. There. No. <laughs> <laughs> Off to a great fantastic. start. Just, just really good start. Um, oh, yeah. Okay, well, so before we get deeper into this, let's go ahead and start with a polling question. Uh, and if Cody, you could throw this up. We're gonna, we want to ask how much of your infrastructure is on Kubernetes today or plan to be migrated in the next six months? Um, and if you can go ahead and hit enter on that. We collect this data over time. We ask similar questions through all of our webinars just to sort of track where the industry is, the kinds of people that are dialing into these webinars uh, helps us know what the audience looks like. So um, click one of those buttons and then um, Cody, if you can bring up the results of that as they become, hey, there we go. Look at that. Um, some, half, all of it. Some is our very scientific uh, that 41% of you have exactly some uh, migrated into Kubernetes is uh, actually 
actually helpful for us, but uh, it's kind of kind of entertaining that, that those are our <laughs> numbers. Okay, so this this doesn't surprise me. I mean, we we tend to have a lot of the people that dial in are not yet in the everything's in Kubernetes uh, mode yet. So um, that makes sense, given that you're dialing into this kind of thing to to listen and learn. Um, glad that a few of you are all in, and hopefully we provide some information that's helpful to people, no matter what life phase you're in in the Kubernetes world. But uh, let's tell you real quick about Fairwinds. So the reason Fairwinds is hosting this uh, and, and I'm here and Andy's here is uh, Fairwinds builds software for platform engineers running Kubernetes so that you can standardize, build best practices for your teams, uh, automate, enforce rules, et cetera. Basically, everybody's switching to Kubernetes still. I want to say everybody switched to Kubernetes, but everybody's still switching to Kubernetes and uh, everyone's afraid they're going to do it wrong. And so what Fairwinds exists to do is to try to standardize that, um, make things easy for teams who are building out best practices so that you're keeping your developers from doing things that are bad ideas in the Kubernetes environment. And uh, that's we've we've played in this space for a long time, building Kubernetes infrastructure, maintaining it, and then now building software around it. Uh, we want to help organizations ship applications faster instead of spending all of their time reinventing the infrastructure repeatable will. Wheel. Will. Wheel. Anyways, that was a lot longer spiel on Fairwinds than I normally give, but I feel good about it. Um, and uh, we actually have another polling question that we're going to go right into right now. The greatest opportunity that you have to improve your Kubernetes environment, uh, because this is also interesting for us. There's a lot of the world right now that's just out to save money. Uh, but if you're not all in on Kubernetes, you might be looking for getting help with the basics, et cetera. I always answer A. Um, I could definitely, definitely use some help with the basics. Getting help with the basics. And give that a second. Click a button, folks. Uh, there we go. Now we're getting some results. Um, and you can throw those up, Cody, because I think it's interesting for people to see those trickle in. Okay, there we are. Yeah, improving the security posture of your clusters. Okay, getting help with the basics. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Some more um, in mix than usual. Yeah, well, but numbers are still coming in. So they, they sort of trickle in large groups. Everybody presses buttons, but it doesn't show us every single update. It shows them in, in groups, which is interesting. Um, okay, great. Well, we're going to hopefully cover lots of these things too. So uh let's talk for just a second what is a platform and alex i'm actually going to put this uh to you like companies build these internal platforms what the heck does that mean why are we building platforms for our teams so they have something to stand on because they want to see higher over a fence what's what are we doing yeah so you know if it, i guess in my mind a platform is about distilling down kind of the the target, the set of tech that you want to launch your applications, deploy your applications to, to a more digestible level for your developers. And depending on your company, that could be that could be a wide range of the target you're trying to hit. Anything from, you know, you they tell you or give you purely the name of the container or the artifact, or maybe not even that, maybe the repo that they want to see magically deployed somewhere, uh, all the way to just taking raw cube or a, you know, a raw stack um, and they get almost direct access to it with, um, uh, with a lightweight set of guardrails around it. So it can really kind of run the gamut depending on what you need. But the focus of it is to both make things easier for your developers. And I, I think primarily reduce the number of things that need to be decided over and over and over and over again by each team. Yes, yes. Okay, I really like that. So um, we're going to go more into this. I will say when we talk about platforms and foundations for a platform, uh, I've heard people say that Kubernetes is really a great foundation for your platform. I'm not sure that's accurate. I think Kubernetes is a little more like somebody giving you a bag of cement and some rebar and saying, good luck, buddy, you still have to build the foundation with Kubernetes if you, you know, and, and you have to know what you're doing a little bit. And, uh, but it is great tools to standardize building that foundation. Uh, and then once you have that foundation, you still have to build the whole rest of the house, but uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a place to get started. So I'm not gonna go into all of these right here. In fact, let me turn off slides, see if I'm bright enough to do that. I got you. Um, 
Yeah, there we go. Hey, thanks, Andy. Um, so let's dive into some questions. And, and to start, uh, Andy, I mean, just tell us about Kubernetes at your company. Where are you running Kubernetes? What kind of size? What kind of scale? Why, you know, why are you here talking about this? And and we'll go uh, we'll go from there. Alex, I'll have you do the same after. Yeah, that's a that's a fun question for me because we do it in a lot of different ways. Um, you know, we got our start running Kubernetes clusters for other companies. So we, you know, build clusters in customer infrastructure. We maintain them. We manage them. We run add-ons for them. Uh, and that's really where, you know, our team got all of its expertise in Kubernetes, doing that over the years across tons of different verticals, different sizes, everything from six node clusters to, I think, you know, six, 700 node clusters. We've seen seen all of those um, and they all in introduce different challenges across three different cloud providers. Uh, and then, you know, we use it internally as well. We have our SaaS product that runs on Kubernetes um, and all of our inter internal tooling that runs on Kubernetes. So, you know, we use it for just about everything. I don't think there's an EC2 instance floating anywhere that isn't either a Bastion or in a Kubernetes cluster. Um, so that's kind of our, our footprint, really. Great. And Alex, uh, Chick-fil-A sort of uh, famously or infamously, depending on who you talk to, runs Kubernetes a lot. Tell us a little bit about that and what your life looks like as a result of that. Yeah. So maybe amusingly, we started using Kubernetes at our edge and restaurant uh, before we started using it in the cloud, um, which is probably very backwards uh, from most people's adoption of it. But um, so right now we have kind of the, the interesting use case. The one people find very interesting typically is our Kubernetes that we run uh, in every restaurant in the chain uh, so that we can run containerized app workloads uh, at the edge in a very similar way that we could in the cloud. Um, and then in the cloud, we have actually piles of clusters. We started our journey from kind of having um, segmented clusters. Each app team had a cluster for dev and a cluster for test and a cluster for prod uh, across many, many app teams, which led us to many, many Kubernetes clusters. Um, and uh, now we're kind of on a journey to uh, having a fewer, um, more centralized set of clusters still separated by environment, but um, where we have more teams working in uh, one set of clusters or in a smaller set of clusters so that we can uh, uh, kind of get more of an economy of scale of those tools that we're maintaining in Kubernetes as opposed to maintaining many, many instances of things. Um, and that's kind of letting our devs get uh, more back to uh, being devs and power users of Kubernetes than having to admin so much stuff in their own clusters. So, so talk for a second about that, Alex, because part of what we're doing in building a platform for our teams is I like to personally, when, when people who don't understand uh, this whole cloud world ask me, you know, what is Kubernetes? I often say it's, you know, think of it like the plumbing of the internet. You don't want to understand everything going on in your plumbing system. You want to turn on your sink let's say I don't always use sync, but let's use sync for the sake of this webinar. Uh, you want to turn on your sync and you want to know it's going to drain, right? You don't want to have to know every pipe, every sewage system, every water filtration system, what goes on behind the scenes. You want to use your sync and your sync to work the way you want it to work. Similarly, if Kubernetes is the plumbing of the internet, making all of that compute go, a developer wants to be able to push their app to production and have it work. And they want the user to be able to interact with it and have it work like their understanding of a sync without having to understand every single piece that's going on behind the scenes to make this work. Uh, you know, from the gravity to the kinds of pipe to how old it is to, you know, how it's processed downstream, right? So what does it look like to make this very, very consumable for developers? Or how do you think about Maybe maybe before we get to how do you do that, let's start with how much do you want your developers to have to understand everything about Kubernetes? Yeah, so that, <laughs> I'm using, I think it's interesting. Uh, it's a conversation I've had with a number of with, with a number of developers internally. Um, and kind of feedback is, is interesting on that, which is some of them, as you would expect, they don't want anything in their way, right? They want to be <laughs> there at raw Kubernetes. I know Kubernetes, don't be in my way. Um, a, a good chunk of other developers they don't care about Kubernetes. They don't even particularly care about Docker. Uh, they have business features to ship and they want to compile, build, and move on. Uh, or at the very least, their interest isn't in Docker. It's not in the orchestration layer. It's in their app. They think their app is cool and want to make it cooler, but you know how it gets run, they're ambivalent about. Um, so 
at the moment, the balance that I've been looking to strike is around uh, providing both, making both sets happy, um, which is kind of possible, which is mostly possible, I'll say, um, in using providing kind of simple abstractions so that those you know that have a minimal set of info, a host name they want something hosted on, and um, a container they want to have run, they can bring that to the table, or um, they can have wider access to the manifests within guardrails of policy, um, you know, do stuff kind of more raw, more low level if they prefer to do that, but kind of choose your own adventure for the dev. So it's, it's a little bit, uh, there are people who are going to want to have a sink and know that their water turns on and turns off and drains. And there are Absolutely. people who are going to look at the sink and want to understand all the piping behind it and where it goes and what they can put down the sink and what they can't and why and where Absolutely. it's going to get clogged if it's going to get clogged. Yeah, and, and I think it comes down, you know, to, to extend your metaphor, I think it comes down to if it does get clogged or when it inevitably gets clogged, does that person, um, is the, are they the type that wants to fix it themselves? They want to open that trap at the bottom of the drain and clear it out, or do they want to call a plumber um, and yeah. have the plumber help them? And that kind of comes down to the individual. Yeah, and that's where I start to wonder about the philosophy, this, you know, this kind of uh, spectrum between not wanting to know anything about how my app gets deployed and wanting to have full control over it. Do you see, um, I feel like I've seen this in the past where when you skew too far towards the complete abstraction layer where the developers know literally nothing and don't care about how, how their app gets to production, that when it does break, they have no choice but to call the plumber. And that plumber is my, my uh, overworked SRE team that may or may not have time to do that, right? And in smaller companies, this probably happens more often. And so I wonder about the value of creating the full abstraction layer without any sort of education or exposure to at least some level of troubleshooting when things break. Yeah, so there's so there's a, there's a give and take here, and there's going to be a spectrum of users on the other end, even when those users are the developers. Uh, is that accurate? Yeah, definitely. And so then. Oh, oh, go ahead, Alex. I was just going to extend with Andy's thing there. I think, you know, another it's something that I've been kind of continuing to mull over for the last year is when it comes to building out a cube platform is um, what what are the expectations your developers are going to have, or when you hire somebody or or bring in a company to work with with your with your platform, with your cube, with an app deployed in it, um, in terms of how they interact with it, right? So a lot of people, if you go take an AWS or a Google or an Azure training course in Kubernetes or one from Fairwinds, um, people are going to come away using kubectl and uh, editing a, a you know a cube YAML file and knowing what a cube service is, etc. Um, if you're running Kubernetes at your company, but you've really created a complete abstraction and nothing anybody is interacting with looks like it, they're not using kubectl. They're you know they're using Every tool that they took in their training and certification class has nothing to do with their use of the platform. <laughs> then it ends, you end up in a very weird spot because you're saying you have Kubernetes and you're hiring for Kubernetes. But um, in practice, they come in and they're learning something totally different. Hmm. So, so OK, so talk about what are the tools that you put in place to make this make sense to your dev? So I've got over here compute. Probably that's a cloud. Could be my own infrastructure. And then a layer on top of that, maybe something in between that and Kubernetes, depending on how I'm running it. Uh, but between Kubernetes and the developer wanting to push something through to production, what are all the layers I'm going to put in between so that things are easy, they don't mess things up, but also I'm not completely abstracting that away. And you know, I, off the top of my head, I'm thinking of a million different tools, uh, but I'm going to try to not feed that into you. So uh, what 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 comes to mind? And Alex, start with you. And then Andy, I'll go back to you again. Sure. I mean, I, I think to kind of start at the beginning, um, I think it starts with, uh, you know, a, a templating layer, whether that's Helm or Customize or another one where you're able to define in that templating layer uh, what your standard, if it were, or set of standard types of apps are, whether those are event-driven, those are standard REST apps, you know, serverless in Cube, whatever that is, so that um, a developer is able to bring kind of that minimum set of information, depending on how that templating engine works, provide it to that template and render out that set of Cube YAMLs or that the contents that would need to be applied to the cluster. Um, you know, from there, I think it's about uh, how does that get applied to the cluster, right? And 
in many cases, um, particularly in, in kind of trainings that you take and certifications, um, they kind of skip uh, what I'll call the the enterprise or kind of best practice layer. They'd all say in best practices, use infrastructure management to apply this stuff, GitOps, et cetera. Um, but in practice, they have everyone do stuff with kubectl. So I think that part can be fairly jarring when you switch over to start using GitOps, for instance, with Argo CD or Flux uh, or GitHub Actions to push and apply stuff to clusters. Because um, now you've disconnected your devs one link from the cluster at that point in terms of how their stuff gets applied. But yeah, so templating layer and then GitOps or similar, um, applying those resources to the cluster. Um, and then at depending on which of those choices have been made, um, uh, policy enforcement, both for security reasons, uh, but also for uh, best practices or just company standards adherence, right? Like naming policy for apps, um, you know, have you set limits and requests? Uh, so everything ranging from best practices, security, and just company policy for how you want your apps deployed. And those can either be integrated up front where, uh, like with Helm, for instance, can do those validations as part of the chart and reject even generating it, um, all the way to the, to the back end in the cluster. Um, and even in the middle where, uh, you have pull request hooks in Git that can reject your developers from, from submitting something that's, uh, doesn't pass the muster. Okay. Andy, what do you want to add to that? Oh, I, you know, I think it's really interesting because whenever I get asked that question, I go from the opposite side. You start from the developer, right? And work forward. I think, you know, I'm, I'm an ops engineer. I come from an ops background. I was a sysadmin before. So I think, okay, you know, we have code, we have a container, but that mm -hmm. container can't just run, right? We have to have a way to get traffic to that container most likely, right? We have to create a DNS name for that. We probably need TLS somewhere. And so in my head, the first thing that comes to mind is always what I call the trifecta. So, which is DNS, TLS, and ingress. Um, so some form of ingress controller so that, you know, and, and a path forward for developers to utilize that ingress controller, whether it's writing an ingress object or if you're using something like glue, adding a route, um, you know, and having sort of the, the happy path for them to add new endpoints to that as they deploy new apps. Um, and then um, cert, cert manager for certs, external DNS for DNS control or however you want to structure your DNS. There's a thousand different ways to do it, of course. Um, but just some way that people can create a new app, put the app in the cluster and get traffic to it. Because when, you know, we're as Fairwind <clears throat> spinning up clusters for new customers, first thing they're going to ask is, well, okay, how do I get traffic to my container that we're deploying? How do we get TLS? How do we do all this stuff? So those are the first things that come to mind for me. And then policy and guardrails on top of all of that, for sure. Um, absolutely necessary. So uh, we're going to come to the policy and guardrails bits, obviously, but but uh, do you ever let your developers loose? Like how much freedom do they have? How many of your developers have root uh, access to all the things? Zero? Um, all of them? Your CEO? Yeah. So in the previous kind of generation of clusters, the many cluster scenario, um, most of the people on that team did just like they have access in um, uh, on those dev teams did just like they had similar levels of access to their AWS account. Right. So uh, that model and those set of teams really spun up out of that, um, that, uh, you know, shift right that happened a number of years ago now uh, where, you know, it's about the DevOps model, right. Where like, Hey, teams should be self-sufficient and um, own all this stuff themselves. That way no one else gets in their way. Um, and so that's been good and it's been fine. It's had some advantages, right? When stuff's broken, they can fix it quickly if, if they can fix it. Um, so in the new model and, and the blast radius, there is also a lot smaller, right? So it's their team stuff. They're responsible for it. If they mangle it, it's on them. Um, and the new model with uh, kind of a bit more multi-tenant internal multi-tenant, but still multi-tenant between teams, um, <laughs> they get very little. So they get read, they can see stuff. Um, they can, do some triage type operations, you know, kick stuff loose. Sometimes you need to take a wrench and uh, bash on a pod, you know, or a service and let either cube restore it or your GitOps tool restore it. Um, so they can kind of break stuff loose, but they don't have kind of those mutating changes. So um, they can't edit DNS and, you know, DNS entries that might be there, edit secrets directly, edit deployments directly, uh, as that would cause kind of drift from what's in Git. Um, and kind of that accumulated state drift over time leads to some big challenges. And well, real quick, 
And before you answer on that, Alex, how do you control all that? Just with RBAC? Do you control that with something else? Yeah, it starts with RBAC and then um, kind of pinned behind RBAC is policy for those things that we can't quite control in the same way with RBAC. Okay, but that's too good of a transition to the policy thing. So I got to I got to go with that. But so so what do you use for policy? I mean, how are you keeping people from because every organization, a, a particularly a sufficiently large one like yours, is going to have internal requirements, external requirements, all kinds of requirements for compliance to keep an auditor happy, to keep your CFO happy, to keep your CISO happy, you know, so how do you Yeah, do so right now, um it's been primarily Kyverno, uh, which is an open source policy manager, um, a little bit of OPA, and then also a good chunk of the, the Fairwinds uh, policy out of the box. Um, I think um, it, it's in an interesting space or an interesting spot because, you know, to me, you, Cube is in a difficult spot right now. It's wonderful and it's great and it should be adopted to make that clear before I uh, throw a little <laughs> bit of shade at Cube. Um, but it's also in, in kind of that space, uh, if, if any of those listening were uh, uh, back in the earlier days of Linux, right? You would set up Linux, but then you would then spend like a couple hours setting up all this stuff, right? Whether it was the logging, so the logging was proper, but also like security, go lock this down, go apply this policy, et cetera. And Cube's kind of in that state still right now where you set up Cube. Wait, hours? I, I remember no. weeks just to get networking working. Yeah. You were you were yeah. a lot better at this than I was, Alex. Keep going. Keep yeah, going. <laughs> well, it depended on the time, yeah. But, but yeah, I mean, you get a lot to set up, um, you know, and in particular, <clears throat> you know, with security, right? It's like, okay, you set up Linux, now install and security enhanced Linux and make all these adjustments to your operating system. And that's kind of the phase Cube is in right now, even with the off the shelf ones from, um, you know, from the major cloud providers and others, you, you set it up, then, you know, you would set up, you know, Fairwinds policy and best practice stuff, or you go grab the Kyverno chunk of, uh, you know, of recommended both best practices and also the, what lets you meet those, uh, what the CIS security standards, um, and then you layer your stuff on it. The, the thing I'd love to see from Cube itself, you know, whether that's from my vendor, like the one who's maintaining or who's producing Cube, EKS from Amazon or similar for GCP or Azure. Um, I would love to see that baseline be an option for starting, you know, the cluster. Cube being secure by default, if it will. Then, you know, to your point, those things that are our company's unique stances and standards and enhancements on those, um, enforcing those with a, with a policy engine like uh, Fairwinds or, or Kyverno or, um, or uh, OPA. I want to pull on that thread a little bit because, um, you know, that, that product sort of exists. I think that's what GKE Autopilot is trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. It's, you know lot of restrictive policies in place. You can't, you can't deploy anything to an autopilot cluster without resource requests and limits, right? Mm -hmm. You know, just that base level of stuff. And what I seem to be hearing from at least some of the, the people that we talk to about it is that it's too restrictive and they can't modify that enough. And so how do you strike that balance? Where do we as a, a Kubernetes community strike the balance between those two? I I think that's, I think it's a really interesting question. I, so I'm not terribly familiar at the moment with where autopilot is. Um, I've seen some stuff about it, but I don't know enough in the weeds to speak about it. But um, I would say in general, I would be curious about pushing back on some of that. I, a number of times when I hear some of that stuff's too restrictive, they're like, it's too restrictive. It won't allow me to run containers as root. You know, it's too restrictive. You know, it it's making me put memory requests and limits in. Right. Um, and it's like, ooh, but I, in, a, in a total sandbox environment, like, you know, great, you know, don't worry about those maybe. But in, even in, you know, test, let alone prod, I mean, and even in dev, um, I can't tell you the amount of pain I have seen by not doing, do, checking those boxes off up front um, and saying, we'll fix that later. Um, it causes production outages. It causes... I mean, pain porting forward it. And honestly, the, the one bone I, I really have to pick with Cube is the fact that they feel like they can't switch it so that run as root is not the default posture um, in Cube um, and kind of in the Docker world as a whole because a lot there's a lot of containers that are built by great community projects out there that you can't even run 
out of the box because they expect to run as root. So now you need to go, you know, switch the the user that the files are owned by internal to the container, set those outside. Um, but anyway, so all of that is a bunch of in the weeds reasons why there's a lot of that stuff that just, it really needs to be there from day one. Cause if you try to clean up, let's say the run is root or not using elevated perms or memories and requests a year into the game, it is so much more pain than just getting those right in the beginning. But I, I am very open to that. There may be, some things that would be, you know, that, that actually are, you know, a little too restrictive that, that might need to be opened up and some of that. Right. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. So there's definitely a, a, yeah. an exception layer that needs to be included at some point, but, and carefully managed, but yeah. uh, most of those things can be avoided for sure. Yeah. I'd, I'd much rather be opting in to a more insecure posture than having to opt into the secure one. Agree. Did we lose Kendall? Yeah. Well, my here my internet's getting a little flaky for sure. No. I think you're back now. Hello. How about now? How about now? Okay. I don't know. It's kind of in and out. Um, okay. So talk pivot pivot a little bit. You're talking about a lot of security related things, but one of the you know requirements that you have internally to keep things working and working smooth is cost. How do you manage Kubernetes cost? And that's like top of mind for everybody right now is money, money, money. The the, the world's caving in, the economy's tanking, nobody's eating chicken sandwiches. Actually, maybe chicken sandwiches are doing real well, even in the, you know, but uh, uh, how do you worry about that? How do you stay on top of that? Um, do you manage cost in Kubernetes in any specific way? I mean, even, you know, setting memory requests and limits is something, but uh, what do you do there? Yeah, so there's probably a, a few layers to that onion. Um, so one is being able to see what cost even means there, right? You know, at, at the very outside edge, you know, you can look at your run class, you know, in your, in your cloud provider for uh, your control plane and the instances it's using, right? You have that, but a lot of times you want to know how much of what projects is taking up what of the cluster, right? What of the bandwidth, et cetera. Um, and so the the main project I'm familiar with that for that is uh, KubeCost. There's probably some others out there that also help give um, uh, cost um, inspection opportunities. Uh, KubeCost is one of the big open source ones. But um, I, I think <clears throat> past that, um, it, it ends up being interesting, right? Because depending on the size of a company and the size of a um, uh, the teams involved, um, infrastructure cost, like so the cost of running um, EC2 instances in, in a cube cluster can frequently be much, much lower than the cost of the headcount, the people working on that project uh, or the licenses and support that you have for tools that you're running in that cluster and in that environment. So um, I think... Cost optimizing is important, right? And being responsible stewards of those resources that you're running. On the flip side, I do also frequently encourage people not to necessarily try to over-optimize for the infrastructure cost. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people spend weeks on end trying to optimize down so their you know app would be running, let's say, twice as efficient in Kubernetes. And so they've literally saved you know, tens, maybe hundreds of dollars a month uh, for the company. But they've spent you know two sprints of a developer time so it'll take a decade to recoup the uh the investment <laughs> who doesn't have a, who doesn't have decades andy what do you want to add to that well i mean i just have to say as a as a fairwinds customer i'm surprised you didn't mention that we do cost as well but uh <laughs> we have we have tools for for visualizing costs in your cluster but um beyond the, the shameless plug there um I will say, I, I love that you said, you know, be cognizant of how much effort you're spending on trying to reduce cost because infrastructure cost is generally a smaller percentage of cost across a company than, you know, other costs. But when you are worried about it, you know, setting those resource request limits first is the number one thing. Um, we have so many people that come to us and they're like, we need to know, we need to right size our nodes. And I'm like, okay, but you're not setting resource requests and limits. So your node count really doesn't mean anything to me until 
you fix the resource request limits. I don't know where, you know, what's using what, uh, and the cluster can't allocate resources appropriately. So that's number one. And then visibility, you know, you're, we're introducing an abstraction layer between your cloud cost and your applications. And if you don't have visibility into that, then you're not going to be able to tackle any sort of cost conversation whatsoever. Um, so whatever tool you use, just a tool, most of the cloud providers don't have that visibility into the Kubernetes layer of cost at this time. So, yeah. And so I want to pause for a second and just say, Hey folks, there's a few questions coming into the Q and a, this is good. Keep them coming. We will have time at the end to come back. Uh, I do see those questions. If you're, Somebody asked one in the chat. I moved it over to the Q&A so we get to it. So put them in the Q&A bar if you see that. Uh, we will come back to those. Um, okay, this is helpful. So yes, I mean, we, we've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, general um, policy, et cetera. We've talked a little bit about uh, cost. I, I will say Kubernetes is one of those funny things where depending on how you've set it up, it can just auto scale, right? Which is one of the wonderful promises of the cloud, like Black Friday, you can be 20 times bigger if you want to be. Uh, but if it's, you know, uh, April 13th, and um, your kube cluster has quadrupled in size, because someone has gotten in and figured out how to mine crypto, uh, you know, do you, do you know where your compute is going? So there's some amount of like being tuned into some of those things is helpful. Uh, and, and even if it's not somebody hacked in, I have a couple of friends who, you know, where a developer set something up and left for the weekend and they came back Monday and they're, you know, they ran a $50,000 experiment, not knowing that's what they were doing. Uh, you know, there's, there's easy ways to cause big problems if you're not tuned in. So have some kind of cost management thing around that. Fairwinds does address that. Um, but let's talk specifically about some of the security things. So security covers, you know, we've, we've done whole webinars on security. We've probably done 20 webinars on security because there's a, always a million things to talk about security related. But um, you've talked a little bit about those tools, but how do you audit your Kubernetes setup? How do you audit the access people have? How do you audit the workloads that are running in the cluster and make sure you're not running nefarious things? Uh, is that automated? Are you doing it manually? How do you, you know, when Log4j comes out with a massive vulnerability, how do you find out where that's running? Um, and you know who you yell at. I don't know. You, you, you don't yell at them for deploying something that didn't have a vulnerability that was known yesterday, I guess. But um, how do you think about that? Um, yeah. So a myriad of approaches, right? So in any good, and uh, in, in, you know, kind of the way you approach anything responsibly today, you you throw everything you can at it from every single direction until it's finally pinned down, kind of. Um, so that's what it kind of feels like wrapping your hands around security today. But, um, so we use a range of things. Um, Fairwinds has some, um, some tooling, um, in, uh, the Fairwinds insights product that helps us do some kind of scanning and visibility into what, um, vulnerabilities that we have currently running in cluster, as well as which things are adhering to best practices, like, um, memory requests, limits, stuff running as root, et cetera, allows us to reject those from even running in the cluster. Um, we do similar with Kyverno as well um, for some different things because uh, there's a bunch of, uh, there's a real good community out there that's producing some, uh, um, you know, turn, we get to cheat and use what other people have submitted as really good um, uh, policies to just go ahead and sling into the cluster to do things that we want uh, in addition to the, the ones that Fairwinds works with us on. Um, and then kind of past that, we use a few other tools, even let's say out of band of Kubernetes itself. So we use um, uh, some container scanning tools around our containers. And we also use a product called Wiz, uh, which has been fantastic for letting us see, uh, have visibility into our security posture, both at a cloud level and that things just in our cloud accounts themselves are, are meeting the muster. But it also looks at, uh, it understands Cube. So we have everything from, you know, the load balancers, IAM policies, Cube, and, um, at what, you know, the severity of those vulnerabilities, et cetera. Um, so we can kind of uh, uh, triage those as they come up. Um, yeah. Good, yeah, well, Andy, what do you wanna to add to that? I don't know that I have much to add, it's a good answer. That's a good answer. What? Yeah. You can't, uh, come on, you yeah. give Alex a big head. <laughs> now, one of the things you can do too that um, some of our customers do is, is trying, you know, you can get the list of vulnerabilities from insights. That's great. But like sometimes for some customers, it's a massive list. And then it's like, okay, how do I tackle this? Right. 
Um, and so a couple of the tools that, that we try to encourage folks to use is we can shift that to the left. So, you know, when you, when you're building a container in CI CD, we can say, Hey, these are the known vulnerabilities in just the container you're building right here. Um, and so then they can go try to mitigate that or having policies to not allow, you know, certain levels of vulnerability to be deployed at, at the time. Of course, there are some that pop up post deployment and then, you know, alerting mechanisms or creating Jira tickets out of that feeding those back to the developers, but shifting it left can be a nice way to distribute the load of that instead of having one central team that's like, hey, we have 10,000 vulnerabilities, we need to fix these. Um, and that's just a mountain of work that not one person can tackle. Um, and then something that's coming up that I can sort of preview here, but uh, base images that you're using to build your containers from are often a source of your vulnerabilities and often an easy way to fix, right? If you're based on Alpine and you know there's a vulnerability that's released, there's probably a new version of Alpine that has mitigated that already. And so um, we're gonna be adding base image detection um, to some of our capabilities to say, we think you're using this base image, go update that, you'll fix these vulnerabilities, so. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so Fairwinds Insights is one of the tools. There are other tooling that out there that do something similar that can stop things from being deployed that have known vulnerabilities or have known security issues or are just configured to run as root. You know, those kinds of things you can stop from being deployed into a cluster with policy. And um, on the one hand, when you're building a platform, if you work on a platform team, you, you feel this tension of like, well, I don't want to keep developers from being able to do their job. Uh, but I also want to put appropriate guardrails around it. But I also think like if you put yourself in the developer's shoes, a lot of times the developer's going, I don't know how to configure this. I don't know what has known vulnerability. Like, please tell me. I don't want to deploy something into the cluster that's broken as a known vulnerability. I'm just trying to do my job. They told me to move the pixel five things to the right, five spots to the right. What's five pixels to the right? They told me to move that picture five pixels to the right. And I'm just trying to deploy. And now I'm going to put a known CVE into the cluster. Why didn't you stop me? How come you didn't build guardrails for me? I mean, it's it's a little bit that, that you know, it's called guardrails for a reason. It's that thing along the edge of a cliff that keeps you from falling off. Uh, you want those there, right? You can be free and hike that same trail without the guardrails, but they make you feel a little bit more secure. Uh, I was on a trail like this just yesterday, so it's very fresh in my mind. Um, anyways, uh, okay, well, for time's sake, I want to make sure that we get to all the questions that we have, and we have a, a number of questions that have come through, but... Um, let me see here real quick. Oh, yeah, there's a bunch here. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, Alex, you mentioned RBAC. How do you handle RBAC? Do devs have access to things? Let's see. Do devs have access to only their team's namespace, or do they have their own clusters? Um, yeah, so in our previous model, teams had their own clusters. and the new model, they have access to only their namespaces. Uh, we use labels on the namespaces to map from their identities to... Um, groups and their identities when they connect to uh, the namespaces that they have access to. Yeah, very Great. similar from our end as well. Yeah. And then somebody asked, thoughts on Red Hat's portfolio, OpenShift, Advanced Cluster Manager, Advanced Cluster Security versus a hyperscaler option like EKS, AKS, et cetera. Um, Andy, you might have more. I don't know, Alex, if you have. Go for it, yeah. No, I was just going to say, um, I've heard wonderful things from Red Hat's portfolio and people that are using Red Hat's portfolio, and I've heard wonderful things from uh, from those on all flavors of kind of the, the hyperscaler options as defined there, as well as some smaller players in the market. Um, I think, uh, and I think that's one of the exciting things about Cube is that um, it, no matter which one of those you're on, you know, sometimes you'll be building in-house stuff, um, and then sometimes you're going to buy something a little more off the shelf from a vendor that you need to deploy into your environment. And because they're all largely adhering to the cube contracts, it's like installing something on Ubuntu versus SUS versus Red Hat in which there may be a little bit of work there to do, but it's still a solid target to hit no matter what. So I would say with any of those, uh, they're all really good options. Great. Um, okay, let's see here. And then, I mean, along those lines, somebody actually asked, uh, Alex, are you using Fairwinds Insights and their managed cluster solution? Why did you choose Fairwinds over other solutions? Oh, man. Oh, that boy, sounds almost a like marketing teed that up. I, I don't... <laughs> uh, I mean, why, why, why did you choose us over, say, OpenShift or something else? Yeah. Um, 
So for a truthful answer, um, no. So about <laughs> trying to go three or four years ago, I, I, I was very interested. I think Fairwinds was very uh, was very early to the game with uh, their insights product um, and some of what they were doing from being able to see both security issues, but really tech debt and best practices issues uh, with their insights product. Um, you know, Kyverna didn't exist. Opa probably existed as a project, but I wasn't really seeing it around too much. And a lot of people weren't leveraging it that I was seeing. Um, I could be wrong on that. Uh, that's usually when I get the message, you know, telling me that Opa was around before Kubernetes or, um, and then it's been heavily used forever. Um, but uh, so I, I found that fairly compelling um, as opposed to some of the other options that were maybe focused very heavily on the, um, uh, on the cube itself front, but not on the um, kind of, where we were going to be two years later with cube front, which I felt Fairwinds had a, a really good handle uh, on when we uh, started to engage with them. Thank you. That's, that's, huh? that's nice. Uh, there was another, it, it's more of a statement than a question. I'll try to put this into a question thing. I keep asking myself, why aren't there more out of the box security bits? So I, I guess maybe that's the question. Why isn't there out of the box security? Why does Kubernetes let us do whatever the heck we want? And uh, to, to the, point of shooting ourselves in the foot yeah i so okay i am not on like the secure the kubernetes security sig or like one of the core maintainers uh so i may be wildly off base here but from talking from some people to some people who were over time and others who are in the know um i, I think part of the challenge there is there's a big focus on not having a big drift on the core API that makes up Kubernetes. Um, and in order for them to address certain things, um, they have to break the contract that a lot of um, apps need. And in some cases, they've been able to do that, like with the switch to RBAC by default uh, as, you know, as the default option um, and a few other things they've deprecated recently. But there's a few others that, for reasons I'm not in the weeds on, it's harder to get over the hump on like the run as root um, or um, stopping the run as root stuff or, uh, or redoing the way secrets work to something that's sane and not absolutely insane. Um, and, uh, but yeah, I, I think the problem is that, yeah, some of those, it's just in the weeds. Um, and then honestly, the other piece of that um, is it's a philosophical difference on what Kubernetes is. So to a good chunk of people, particularly people at, from my conversations with some people who've worked on core Kubernetes and, and worked at, at Google and some others is they see cube as the just total, you know, I'm trying to remember the metaphor Kindle used earlier, but um, you know, it, it's the building block. It's the Legos that you're going to put a platform on top of that your users won't even know they're in Kubernetes. Um, you know, it's the basis for you building your own complete platform. That's at its own complete interface. Um, and I think that is a fair way to look at it. I also think that what, you know, me as a, a customer of Kubernetes and what a lot of other users are looking for is something where like, well, no, no, that, why can't Cube be the platform? If you make these three little twists, it can be either, right? You can keep people close to it or you could completely abstract it if you want. Um, and so I think, but I think that philosophical piece there is one of the reasons why um, some of that hasn't gotten across. Similar reason to why generics didn't make it into Go forever. Um, cause I, I'll tell you it, it, let's say in defense of that, even though I'm on the other side of the fence, um, a lot of, um, it's very easy as somebody who uses this thing to demand new features and say, you want new features and you want change. Um, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of projects I've followed over time that, um, and actually I probably for the better part of Valor won't name them but that have gotten lost along the way, right? They got all the features in there that everyone talked about would be cool and awesome and change the world. And three or four years in, you have a project that's a nightmare for new people to come in to use, maintain. It's got security problems. It's hard to understand, digest. Um, and by keeping things tight and close, you know, and close, um, everyone at the end of the day is actually able to move faster and better. So, um, yeah. 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 It's a big mess of problem. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 like you're saying, it's kind of a, a balancing act by the maintainers of flexibility, reliability, and security. And I mean, 
really at any given time pick two maybe right but you're always just balancing between lots of different factors and looking at it from one perspective of security is lacking is uh, an underdeveloped view of a very what is a massive code base and a very complex project mm -hmm. that has its own governing system around it and so well and i i, I want to add to that when somebody gives you rebar and cement you know, you could take that and say, well, why isn't this preformed into a foundation? Well, because you can use it to make an enormous foundation, a tiny foundation. You can you can make a porous foundation or a solid foundation. You can build a boat with it. It's a, maybe a bad idea, but you could. And, uh, you know, there's that's that's the thing about Kubernetes is you can do anything in it right up to setting your entire organization on fire because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, if you want out of the box sane defaults, Check out Polaris. That's one of our Fairwinds open source projects. It exists because we've seen lots and lots and lots of people stand up Kubernetes and have no idea what they're doing and make the same mistakes over and over and over again. And so there's a whole bunch of policy in there that's out of the, you turn on the out of the box defaults, it's going to enforce a whole bunch of things that just make sense. We push that into Insights, our SaaS product with a whole bunch of other same defaults. If you want same defaults, Use a product like that, open source, or use Insights if you have a whole bunch of clusters. It's actually really easy to get reasonably right. Now, you're probably going to have some compliance needs that are specific to you and your organization and your vertical and all kinds of things. But um, I want to get to this next question, too, because we are going to run out of time here. So this says, I know that you mentioned that high costs are not usually associated with the platform at the or the infrastructure level. However... We sometimes have the opposite problem where we compare our infrastructure to name brands and find out that our costs are multiples higher. Uh, with that said, do you think this is due to not doing things right? Or are we developing, not developing with scaling in mind? What are top three, what are three top priorities to design and develop for scale in Kubernetes for a platform? It's a good question. Yeah. So I think in my mind, there's, so the devil's in the details on that frequently. So it can be a little hard to say without looking the weeds, but uh, just having seen kind of some circumstances like that in the past, I, I would say um, one piece is density. So, you know, how much I'm going to say work, how much business work are you getting out of uh, your containers and those nodes, those instances, those are running on. So that kind of hits at two tiers. One is like the programming languages is involved. Um, to avoid throwing you know further shade at projects in this, I'll, I'll keep these generic. But some programming languages, right, take a lot of memory and a lot of CPU to handle a certain amount of requests. Uh, you know, while some other languages or or more modern frameworks in those languages require substantially less, sometimes a hundredth the amount of CPU uh, in memory to handle a certain volume of requests. So I, I've definitely seen where um, some maybe some older code has been poured ported forward um, and handling many more requests than it ever did in the past. Um, and so it's just a lot of a lot of memory, a lot of CPU serving very little at the end of the day. So some optimizations can be had there. Um, another one is density. Um, it, particularly in our many cluster scenario, we have piles of clusters right now that are running as three node clusters in, you know, in multiple AZs um, that are running like two or three apps. They're, they're not dense at all. Um, and so that lack of density, if you have this big sprawl of lots of clusters that are only fractionally used, um, you can end up coming out, you know, much higher on the top end. But um, there's a number of tools. Uh, I, Fairwinds has some good kind of insights into um, uh, your cluster and like what your run costs are, what's being used on the nodes that can help. Um, you know, there's a few other tools to that effect as well to kind of give you that visibility into what does your density look like? And there's some other really cool projects coming out in that front as well. Uh, Carpenter from EKS and a couple open source projects I wish I could remember of offhand. And I, I know GCP has one as well where um, it may, it launches instead of, to keep it short, it helps you manage um, the containers to hosts uh, that are running, uh, which can really help you bring uh, that density level up and your total costs down. Great. So, uh before I give a final wrap up here and then turn over to Cody to handle the gift card giveaway, any nuggets of wisdom for all the Kubernetes people that are tuned in? I mean, we, we gave said a lot of things. Anything I didn't ask, you want to give one, uh, hey, everybody, don't forget your towel kind of uh, comment before we wrap up? Um, at the end of the day, remember, like, don't compare 
or yeah, make sure you're comparing apples to apples on stuff. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of times people say Kubernetes is complicated, right? Um, Kubernetes spinning up a cluster and then using kubectl against it is about, you know, is as easy as Docker Compose, is as easy as a Lambda. Um, it's once you start adding everything that makes your company stuff together into a full CI CD platform, you know, from GitOps and tooling and authentication and all that stuff is when it starts to get complicated, but you'll see those in those other spaces too. If you do those in those ways, that said, if you're at a smaller company or a smaller team and you've been doing things manually and in, in your, um, cloud providers console, and you've been happy with that and you've been fine with Lambda with that huge risks involved with that, but don't look at a shift to Kubernetes as going, all in with the whole stack in the right way of doing things as one giant leap. Cause that one giant leap will just feel overwhelming. Um, if you take steps, look at where you are now, look at doing an analog for that in Kubernetes and then taking steps along that journey to improve your, um, your setup there. I think you'll find a lot more success and joy with it. Andy, anything to add? I'm going to end with the thing that I always end with because I still see it despite the fact that we're seven years in and uh, set your resource requests and limits, please. That's it. Use use Goldilocks. We have an open source project <laughs> for that. If you have lots of clusters across lots of places, use Insights. Goldilocks exists because Andy got sick of seeing this problem like four years ago, and here we are still. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Cody here in just a sec, but just want to say thank you, everyone, for coming. Alex, thank you for joining and having this talk with us as well. Um, for everyone's sake, if you are using Kubernetes and you want help, we have services for that. We have software for that. We will make your life easier. That's why Fairwinds exists. Uh, you can go build all of this yourself and do it the hard way, or you can let us knit it together for you and make it nice and smooth and easy and pretty um, and uh, save yourself some pain. Give us, give us a call. So look us up if you're, if you're interested in that. I don't have a call to action right now. I'm just going to turn it over to you, Cody, and uh, you can take us home. All right. Sounds good, Kindle. So thank you so much, Kindle, Andy, and Alex. I really appreciate having you guys on TechStrong Learning with me today. So I'd like to remind everyone that our session today was recorded. So should you want to rewatch or share with a friend, you will be emailed the copy of the recording. And you can also find it living on the Container Journal website at containerjournal.com slash webinars. And be sure to look in the on-demand section. The four winners of our $25 Amazon gift card drawing, they are Rachel D, Carolyn R, Chris G, and Joanna R. So to our four winners, congratulations. Keep an eye on your email inbox to claim your gift card. It should make its way to you in about the next 48 hours. But if you don't happen to see that email, do check your spam folder just in case it got filtered out. I'd like to thank Fairwinds for sponsoring our program today. And to everyone who's joined us for the past hour, thank you so much for being here. We really value your time and we want to hear your feedback. As soon as we close out, there will be a survey that pops up. So let us know what you thought about our program today or if you have any suggestions for any upcoming programs. Either way, we hope to see everyone at a future TechStrong learning experience. Have a great rest of your day. And Andy, Kindle, Alex, thank you all.